and welcome to this session on stratified care in low back pain management. My name is Bruna Fulham. I'm an Associate Professor of Physiotherapy in the UCD School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science, University College Dublin. In this lecture, I'll present an overview of the prevalence of low back pain and evidence-based treatment approaches. Managing low back pain using a stratified care approach, the start back tool will be discussed and how utilizing this prognostic screening tool with matched treatment approaches is effective in managing low back pain. I draw your attention to the low back pain series published in the Lancet in 2018 that discusses what low back pain is, why we need a call for action, and what is the evidence for the prevention and treatment of low back pain. So what do we know about low back pain? First of all, we know that it's very common, that there's a lifetime incidence of over 80%. Most episodes of low back pain are short lasting with little or no consequences. However, we do know that flare ups or reoccurrence of low back pain episodes are common and over 70% of people experience multiple episodes. So we need to reconceptualize low back pain and consider it a bit like the flu. So if you get the flu, you rest, you change your behavior, you might take some over-the-counter medication to help with symptoms such as high temperature or aches and pains. However, once you get over the flu, you go back to your normal levels of activity and activities of daily living. But the fact that you've had the flu once, it, you won't be surprised should you get the flu again. So this is why we need to also think of episodes of low, low back pain. You've had it and it might reoccur in the future, but taking simple steps can help manage this condition. Low back pain is over representative in lower socioeconomic groups. And although it is a common condition, only 10 to 12% become disabled by their low back pain. It's a very costly condition. It's the largest cause of disability in the United Kingdom. And obviously uh, it causes a significant global burden. It's actually the number one cause of disability worldwide. In terms of managing low back pain, majority of low back pain should be managed in primary care. And physiotherapists and general practitioners are the gatekeepers to the health service with regards to low back pain. And then in terms of treatment, of course, physiotherapists are the primary caregivers for low back pain management. So in terms of triage, firstly, of course, we need to exclude non-spinal pathology, and then we need to consider red flag pathology with patients presenting with low back pain. Once the, and then we allocate patients to one of three broad mechanical categories. So in terms of red flags, about 1% of people presenting with back pain will have red flags. And red flags include vertebral fractures, a malignancy, spinal infections, axial spondyloarthritis, arthritis, or cord equina syndrome. And of course, these patients need direct on re referral for specialist investigation. About 14% of people will present with nerve root pain, but true nerve root pain is more accurately assessed at about 5% of those presenting. So again, patients in this category will present with, can present with significant uh, symptoms, burning, shooting, uh, 
pain in their leg. Their leg pain will be worse than the back pain and pain will be worse distal compared to proximal. Patients may complain of pins and needles and they may or may not have neurological deficits. And then the majority of patients will present with mechanical or non-specific low back pain. This is about 85% of patients presenting with pain arising from between uh, the lower ribs and the gluteal folds. This slide summarizes treatment approaches that are common to the Danish, to the US and the UK clinical practice guidelines for non-specific low back pain. So for the most common category of people presenting with low back pain. So if we consider, first of all, people presenting with acute back pain. So this is pain of less than six weeks duration. In terms of treatment, first line treatment approaches, including advice to remain active and education about back pain, category of back pain and prognosis. Second line treatments or treatments that can be undertaken in conjunction with first line treatments including offering heat, spinal manipulation, and massage. For people presenting with persistent low back pain, so this is pain for more than 12 weeks duration, again, first-line treatment includes advice to remain active and education with regards to their pain and evidence-based approaches. Exercise therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy are also first line treatment approaches. In terms of second line treatment approaches, spinal manipulation, massage, mindful, mindfulness-based stress reduction and interdisciplinary rehabilitation are all considered second line or adjunct approaches. So in terms of who goes on to develop chronic pain, the research will tell us that psychosocial factors are greater predictors of chronicity than physical factors. So having previous episodes of back pain, being significantly limited in your activities, having leg pain, higher pain scores, and poor health related quality of, of life are all predictors for chronicity. Similarly, psychosocial factors, so which include psychological and psych psychosocial stress, having pain-related fear of movement, being depressed, having passive coping strategies with regards to your ability to manage your pain, and having negative expectations for recovery and or catastrophizing are all significant predictors of chronicity. So it makes sense as patients move from having acute to chronic pain, we need to consider risk stratification based on psychosocial factors to match treatments in findings and prognosis for care. So the Start Back tool is an example of a stratified care approach where it matches patients to treatment based on prognosis or their risk of poor clinical outcomes. So the Start Back tool was developed by Jonathan Hill and colleagues from the University of Kiel. So they have a very comprehensive website, which I encourage you to visit. And the Start Back tool is now offered as an app. So there's lots of information. The website details are on the slide. So the Start Back tool is a simple classification system based on nine questions. The patient either disagrees or agrees with the statements provided. The scoring system is on the right. So from a total possible score of nine, for the patient who scores three or less overall, they are categorized as being in the low risk category. If a patient scores four or more, you then look at the psychological subscale. And this is responses questions five to nine. So for the questions five to nine, if the patient scores three or less, 
they're classified being of medium risk. If the patient scores four or more on the psychological subscale, which is questions five to nine, they're considered, considered to be of high risk. So having classified the patients based on the start back tool, one then stratifies the patients to match to treatment approaches. The start back tool has been tested for validity and reliability in different populations. So in terms of treatment, we all recognize that patients are not the same, so targeted treatment is needed. For patients classified as being in the low risk category, advice, reassurance, and following re medication recommendations either from their pharmacist or their doctor is recommended. For patients classified as being in the medium risk category, these are patients who face physical obstacles to recovery so they will require some face-to-face -face treatment approaches. And then finally, for patients in the high-risk group, they have more psychological obstacles to recovery and therefore require an enhanced package of care. These are more complex patients and they need more complex treatment. So in terms of stratified care, this slide summarizes targeted treatment for those in the low, medium and high risk categories. So beginning with the low gr risk group, these patients need minimum intervention. So a one-off session, educating the patients about their pain and promoting positive messages about prognosis, the need to stay active and to remain at work if possible. A useful resource, is the back book. And this contains evidence-based positive messages that can be useful for patients. In terms of targeted treatment for those in the minimum medium risk group, again, the education material delivered to the low risk category is useful and providing copy of the back book is also useful. These patients also require a progressive exercise program that would include both stability and strengthening exercises. In terms of the high risk group, again, target treatment, education as per the medium risk group, but also adopting a psychologically informed approach to treatment to include cognitive behavioral principles. So cognitive behavioural principles include teaching patients about pacing. So all activities, be it exercise, gardening, housework, sitting, should be time-based and not pain-based. And this will reduce patients from falling into the overactive, underactive cycle. Where on days they feel well, they may completely overdo an activity, which may lead to an increase in their pain or increase in fatigue leading to significantly reduced activity levels over subsequent days. Pacing will also help to reduce fear of movement and it'll help people reach their treatment goals. So in essence, we're coaching the patients. We also need to ensure compliance with long-term self-management approaches. So encouraging patients you know, to, to maintain their, their exercise or physical activity approaches by, you know, by changing what they're doing over time in terms of exercise, physical activity, uh, their mindfulness, relaxation uh, approaches. So I suppose encouraging patients to change what they're doing, you know, and, and reinforcing that it's, it's good for them uh, to do this. Again, supporting patients in being able to set realistic short-term, medium-term and long-term goals is important. And of course, these need to be the patient's goals and not the physiotherapist's ideas of what the patient's goals should be. And this can be if it's work or leisure, so, social activities um, across all areas of uh, daily living. And it's important that patients celebrate success when they reach goals and that they can deal at the same time with uh, minor failures or setbacks, you know, over the, the term of uh, their long-term goals. 
teaching patients to manage flare-ups. So recognizing that they're in the middle of a flare-up and also supporting them to develop strategies to help them manage and get through a flare-up. So whether it's using heat or ice or more relaxation, more stretching, or temporarily, temporarily reducing their levels of activity and then giving them strategies once the flare-up has eased of how to increase their activity again in a paced way to resume normal levels of physical function. And underpinning all of cognitive behavior principles is, of course, education, education around their condition, education around the treatment approach. Pharmacist or the general practitioner will educate them around the medication management. Um, and also we're educating them around pain neuroscience. And all this is done through using effective communication strategies. Physiotherapists sometimes find it challenging to explain pain neuroscience to patients. And similarly, patients can find it challenging to understand neuroscience. So Joe Nidge and colleagues in 2011 and 2019 published two good papers where they describe pain science metaphors that we can use to explain when we're explaining uh, to patients about uh, their pain. So the first metaphor they use is the accelerator and brake on in a car. So they describe how they use this to describe how the brain controls two top-down systems. So in terms of pain inhibition, you can use the brake. In terms of pain facilitation, you can use the accelerator. And then the second metaphor on the right is where they illustrate nociceptive pathways and how you can use a, an email spam filter to describe and illustrate descending nociceptive inhibition. So I encourage you to review these two papers. The references are at the end of this presentation, and it may help your explaining pain neuroscience to patients. Again, with all communications with patients, we need to be effective. If we want patients to absorb and implement health-related information, they need to understand what is being said to them. So in terms of effective communication approaches, always be specific and concrete when you're talking to your patients and don't talk in general terms. Limit the amount of information you give patients to three or five key messages. And when delivering messages, be positive, be hopeful and be empowering. Always use health literacy sensitive approaches when either writing or talking to patients. And I draw your attention to the European Pain Federation EFIC Plain Talking Campaign. And in this Plain Talking Campaign, EFIC have developed resources for healthcare professionals, for patients and for people living with pain about clear communication. They've developed free to download infographics as well as short videos. So I recommend go onto the website uh, to learn and uh, to use the health literacy sensitive information that's been developed. So part of this, of course, is to use plain language, whether you're speaking or you're writing. Use the same words as your patient. So reflect back if the patient's talking about burning, stinging, shooting pain, Reflect that language back to the patients when you're talking to them. Use pictures, use models, demonstrate um, whether it's uh, exercises or mindfulness or relaxation, demonstrate what you mean uh, to the patients. And again, as I've already mentioned, use metaphors. We're always going to be more successful if we can communicate clearer. So coming back to the start back tool and the efficacy for its use. So as I mentioned, Jonathan Hill and colleagues in 2011 published a large randomized control trial of 851 patients. They stratified the intervention group based on the start back tool 
and then had a matched control group uh, for usual care. So at one year follow-up, what did they find? They found that patients stratified into the low, medium and high risk group had significantly improved clinical outcomes, that higher levels of satisfaction, and they spent much time, less time off work. In terms of costs, stratified care was cheaper. On average, it was 34 pounds cheaper per individual in terms of direct health care costs. And it saved an average of 675 per person in terms of overall societal costs. So this treatment approach treated patients on an individual um, that is a one-to-one -one basis. Then in 2016, Murphy and colleagues, again, using patients in primary care, adopted a group-based approach to the intervention. So they compared stratified group intervention with the usual care group of patients. This was a non-randomized controlled trial. However, they found at 12 weeks, superior outcomes in the high-risk group who were stratified compared to usual care, and equally good outcomes for those in the medium and the low risk groups. So indicating that despite less treatment, the outcomes were equally good. And this is important in a busy and overburdened primary care setting. So whether it's in group-based or an individual approach, the efficacy of the start back tool has been established. So in summary, at the end of this presentation, we know that low back pain is common. It's important that we address misconceptions about the cause, prognosis, and effectiveness of different treatments. We need to use treatment approaches that evidence has shown that they're safe, that they're effective, and that they're also cost effective. We know that stratifying patients at the outset based on the psychosocial factor is going to enhance outcomes. And overall, the take home message is that we need to promote the notion of positive health and the ability of people to adapt and to be able to self manage in the face of physical, psychological, and social challenges. And here I include key references from the presentation. Thank you.